All right. Hello, everyone. How is everyone? All right. So I haven't seen you guys for a while. I hope you've been uh, doing well with Andreas. Uh, we are here for MOOC 7, uh, session number 8. It has been interesting times in Bitcoin land uh, since we last spoke. So there's been a lot of action. I don't know how many of you have been following it, but it's certainly been one of the more interesting periods. So we get to see some real life discussions in uh, the world of Bitcoin that actually have some theoretical underpinnings. Uh, and I'm going to go to our questions in a second, but I'd leave you with this thought that's a general thought. Right now you're seeing an argument, let's say, between the small block team and the large block team that is effectively an argument about what type of network Bitcoin is going to be in the medium term. Is it going to be a settlement network that doesn't need high throughput and what it needs is extremely rigid security with the higher throughput payments happening at a layer above or is it going to be the one master network for all types of payments of all type or you know some people say well we're somewhere in between and the first is more of an analog of how existing payment systems work so you have real-time gross settlement systems like fedwire and um, uh, target in, uh, and then you have on top of that retail payment systems that don't work on a gross settlement basis, don't have finality of transaction, and it's how you actually pay with a credit card quickly. You're playing with a credit card quickly because you're not settling for another two or three days. And so that would be an analogy, an analogy to the existing financial system. And then there's other people would say, well, no, we ought to be able to do all transactions on the blockchain directly with a low uh, payment cost. And we don't want to do these things in second layer networks like Lightning Networks and so on. I'll be honest, I don't know who's right. I think it's actually a very interesting discussion. Um, and it's being played at a pretty high technical level and spilling over into a lot of like emotional, political anxiety for a lot of people. So it's... Uh, we're going through one of those interesting periods that Bitcoin seems to be able to create every few months to be in some form of, if not crisis, of uh, creative tension uh, as it is now. So anyway, this is not the topic of today's uh, session, so I'm going to get myself back on topic now. And there's actually a really good set of questions today. So. I think we're going to be nicely covered with the existing questions that have come uh, in, and then we'll see what we'll do after uh, after we go through these questions. Question one, do you think it is possible to tokenize existing fiat currency and operate a form of payment system without the help of the central banks today? Or would any type of digital fiat currency have to be issued by a central bank? The answer is yes to both, and the question is the, the differentiation is the conditions you set. The only, per, the only entity that can tokenize an existing fiat currency and not have counterparty risk is a central bank. So let's think about what this means. So let's say we were going to tokenize our new dollar coin we're going to launch a new cryptocurrency we'll call it us dollar coin and we're going to say every us dollar coin can be exchanged for one us dollar now the first question like oh, who is going to make that guarantee who's going to be the issuer that will make that guarantee um and the answer to that is well let's say it was jp morgan JP Morgan says, I've issued my US dollar coin. Um, I guarantee that there won't be any currency risk if you use US dollar coin. 
because if you transfer a US dollar account to my JP Morgan address, I will give you one US dollar. That works. JP Morgan can do it. It would take away currency risk. So you can say, oh, this thing's only worth one dollar, but but you would take on counterparty risk. Um, the counterparty risk um, would be that JP Morgan was not able to meet its obligations. Let's say JP Morgan had a big trading loss, lost $50 billion, uh, doesn't have any liquidity, and you come and say, here's my dollar coin, give me a, give me a dollar. JP Morgan says, oh, I'm sorry, I can't meet my obligations. Please go take your claim to bankruptcy court. Okay. So what you have there is something that is called a US dollar coin. Okay. Trades sort of like a US dollar coin, but is really a JP Morgan coin. And what's a JP Morgan coin? It's a US dollar coin plus or minus the credit risk of JP Morgan. And really minus the credit risk of JP Morgan. Um, so what what how would I synthetically using that build an actual US dollar coin? Well, it would be the JP Morgan coin or the US dollar coin issued by JP Morgan plus a CDS credit default swap in the same amount on JP Morgan. And then you'd ask yourself, all right, well, what is the counterparty that has written the CDS? And do I am I comfortable that they can deliver on their obligations? It's turtles all the way down, right? You can't, it's very hard to get away from counterparty uh, risk. So, but I mean, it'd be close. JP Morgan's a pretty good credit. I mean, I would lend JP Morgan $1,000 and be comfortable that I'd likely get $1,000 back, right? It'd be close to a dollar coin, but it wouldn't exactly be a dollar coin. Now, who can make a credible, a hundred percent risk-free dollar coin. Well, the U.S. Treasury, right? They can say, "No, well, yeah, this is uh, the U.S." Uh, they can say, "That's our Federal Reserve." They can say, "Well, we have several trillion dollars in circulation, and now I am going to issue fifty billion worth of a cryptocurrency that I'm going to call a U.S. dollar coin." And I can effectively guarantee the value will never fall below a dollar because I am willing to say if you give me a US dollar coin, I will give you one US dollar. And I can give you one US dollar because I'm pretty credible that I can issue US dollars, right? Like countries never default in their own currency. They can devalue in their own currency, but they don't really default in their own currency. They only default when they have foreign denominated debt. Here it's debt denominated in the currency of their own country so of course they can always redeem that you know that would have a little bit of a risk that it would actually trade at a premium because someone might say oh i have demand for cryptocurrency and i want cryptocurrency and this is a nice cryptocurrency because i can trade do all the nice things you do with cryptocurrency but i'm not taking on any currency risk so not where it's going to go up it's going to go down it's going to go in any of these directions so this is what you probably also want to say is any time the, val the value wouldn't go below a dollar. Because if it went below a dollar, people could make easy money by buying them for 90 cents, taking them to the central bank and getting a dollar back. But they might trade above a dollar. And so then the bank would probably have to make some type of statement that every time it trades more than a dollar, they'll issue more so the price falls down. Um, the um so this is uh they'd be a good issuer of this their problem I and mean, kind of the question you know why haven't they done this right? it doesn't make a lot of sense it would take away one of the big things that people get worried about when using cryptocurrency and i had a chat with someone fairly senior in the federal reserve about this and the issue that they're going to have is that it's going to be hard for them from a KYC, know your customer, AML, anti-money laundering perspective, 
for them to truly treat this electronic instrument the way they treat cash, aka don't check who the person is using it. Don't know your customer. Don't apply anti-money laundering procedures, right? So let's think about what this means in practice. If I give, if I take $10 cash and give $10 cash to George, no one is running an AML KYC check at that point. But if George wants to sign up for a prepaid debit card of $10, he's going to have to show a whole bunch of identification of who he is. Bitcoin operates generally like cash. And so if you really wanted an equivalent, a tokenized U.S. dollar, you'd really want a tokenized U.S. dollar that operates a cash, which means someone ought to be able to come to the Federal Reserve and say, here is my dollar coin. Give me one dollar. No, don't ask me who I am. And it appears that psychologically, internally, they're going to struggle with that, which is why you don't see these things launched yet. Because once you add in the overhead of, oh, before you use these things, you need to get go through a KYC check. In other words, you need to go through something resembling opening a bank account. It's hard to say you truly have an open, permissionless digital system that anyone can use, including machines, right? One of my general themes is... There'll be interesting questions if Bitcoin is a retail payment service, if Bitcoin's a settlement network. All of these things are very interesting. But the one thing I'm almost certain of is some Bitcoin or something like it will be how machines trade value with each other. Because machines, because machines just means any piece of software in this context, aren't going to go through a KYC AML check at a bank. The bank wouldn't even know what to do with them. Right? Like how, how is that even going to work? So I think the thing holding the banks back is that generally today for electronic transactions, they look for identification and they're going to have a hard mental block saying, well, let's treat this like cash, but it's electronic because that's what it really would be. <coughs> um, related question. If a central bank were to start issuing digital fiat currency, how could this new form of currency work in conjunction with the rest of the world if foreign banks, dealers, don't have access to blockchain technology? Do you foresee some sort of situation where digital fiat currencies operate alongside the current system for a period of time while slowly taking existing currency out of circulation? Or would the issuance of a digital fiat currency has to be a coordinated approach with a number of other countries for it to be affected. Otherwise, how would they transact with the rest of the world? This, I think, unlike the first question where I thought there were a bunch of difficulties, um, in this part, I actually don't foresee any problem. For sure, if this was rolled out, it would be rolled out incrementally. No country is going to say, great, let me get rid of, and by the way, not just cash, right? I mean, there's most money supply is not in cash. It's in electronic systems that are just centralized. Those aren't going to go away. Cash isn't going to go away overnight unless, you know, you're India, which is doing the most interesting experiment in demonetization I've ever seen. Uh, and so what would happen is I think at first you'd launch, if the money supply of the United States is several trillion, you'd launch 50 billion to start. And then you take it to 75, then you take it to 100, and bit by bit, you'd increase it while leaving the other systems in place. Now, the question of, well, how can people use it if they don't have the infrastructure? But that's the beauty of this thing, right? Nothing's stopping you. If it was a Bitcoin-like blockchain, nothing. Nothing's stopping me from downloading the Bitcoin client, and now I'm in business. I have the infrastructure. It's a download. I don't require any other steps. So if a foreign bank dealer, my sense is if the U.S. government said we are offering a crypto dollar, every foreign bank and currency dealer would go download the client software to be able to transact with it. I can't imagine why they would. Um, next question. What are your thoughts 
on central banks slash governments having complete, complete control slash oversight over capital flows. E.g., China gets strict on Forex transactions to stop money existing abroad. My first thoughts are that people will always find a way to go around these rules, but would a digital fiat currency finally provide a foolproof way for governments to control it? Should citizens be worried, regardless of their reasons for wanting to move money? All right, well, let's unpack this question because there's a lot going on in this question. First of all, are there non-freely convertible currencies? Yes, they always have been. There are many still in, in, in play today. What are the reasons people are doing it? Sometimes to protect the economy. Sometimes they believe that capital would flee their economy for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they're doing it to try and control the exchange rate. It's, it's certainly a thing that happens. Do they ever get complete control of it? No, never. Um, markets always emerge for everything. Human ingenuity always emerges for everything. So anytime the official currency rate starts to float too far away from what the market currency rate will be, you end up with a black market in that currency. Um, and people will go through all types of convoluted ways to try and create that market. And you've seen this everywhere. Does that mean that it's totally pointless for countries to have capital controls? No. No, I mean, when capital controls are needed for whatever reason people believe they're needed, in many cases they mostly work even if there is a bit of a black market because black markets are a pain, they're a nuisance. Many people might not need to use them or might on the margin be discouraged. There's a difference between, it's like saying, I don't know, speed limits. Do does any road that has speed limits have 100% of people below the speed limit? No. There's always someone who's going over the speed limit. Does that mean everyone goes over the speed limit? No. Does that mean people are driving on the road more slowly than if there wasn't a speed limit? Definitely. Right? Definitely. So it, it can simultaneously be the case that you know speed limits are not 100% effective, and you still want to have speed limits on your roads because they're 80% effective, 75% effective, 60% effective. So capital controls are kind of like that. Now, then the question becomes, is there, uh, if you had digital fiat currency, would you be able to have perfect capital controls? And I actually think not. And I'm assuming digital fiat currency in a decentralized manner, right? In a centralized manner, in a centralized manner, well, that's what you have now, and that's actually fairly easy to implement capital controls over. If you say, I am the United States, and I don't want people sending capital to Cuba, right? That's a form of capital control, right? The US doesn't have generalized capital controls, but they certainly have specialized capital controls. Well, in the digital fiat money, aka the money in the banking system, that's a pretty easy rule to implement. You send a circular to all the banks and say, from today on, you will not send wire transfers to Cuba. If you do, we will fine you, and if you keep doing it, we'll come lock up some executive of yours. That tends to be pretty effective, right? Not too many, not too many banks will say, yeah, thanks a lot. Well, we're gonna do it anyway, right? Like in fact, you can even cut it off because no one's really directly sending them, and it's a longer story. There's layers of systems. That's fairly easy to cut it off. Now, would a cryptocurrency be a foolproof way to implement capital controls? I don't think so, actually, because it's hard to say where a cryptocurrency is. Right? Like if it's a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, where is a Bitcoin? I mean, just out of curiosity, where is it? 
And then a very interesting session about three years ago with a top law firm in New York on pensions. There is a pension rule that says certain type of pension plans must hold their assets in the United States. And then we had this huge theological discussion of if you have a Bitcoin, is it in the United States? Honestly, I have no idea what the answer is there. So it's on the blockchain that's held on several thousand computers around the world, including in the United States, including everywhere else. Uh, is that what matters? Or does what matter is who has the private key? Okay, well, what's the private key? The private key is some letters and numbers. Are those letters and numbers in the United States? Well, okay, I mean, if you're in a piece of paper and you're safe, maybe that's in the United States. But what if I have a very good memory and I memorize my private key? And I go on a flight to England. Has the nexus of the Bitcoin moved? Has the Bitcoin moved to England because I just went on a flight to England? Seems odd, right? Doesn't seem like me going on a plane ride should change the location of the Bitcoin. In fact, let's say I have two copies of the private key. I've written it on two pieces of paper. The one's in my safe in New York that I've shown my auditor and say like, look, the nexus in the United States. And by the way, I just kept an extra copy just to be sure. And while I was in England, the copy in New York gets destroyed. And now there's only the copy with me in England. Is it definitely not in the United States now? I mean, it, these are the types of questions where the, the fact that there's no answer means the question is not exactly relevant to a cryptocurrency. Right? If you have a deposit at <clears throat> your regional community bank that is located in Birmingham, Alabama, and 100% of their employees are in Birmingham, Alabama, and they have access to the Fed Regional Bank um, in the Southeast. Richmond, I think, is where they'd be, I think. And they can pretty definitively say that if you have a deposit there, you have an asset that's held in the United States. It's definitive, right? There's no question that's not in Venezuela. With Bitcoin? Who knows? So even before you get to whether or not you've transferred to someone out of you've transferred to someone out of china in this future crypto one i might even argue that before you transfer anything it's already out of the country right if it's truly an open decentralized currency where everyone can download the client and everyone has a copy of the blockchain what does it even mean where the capital is because anyone with the private key can decide to move that value. And then the private key becomes very hard to control. It's very hard to control the physical location of a series of numbers and numbers. So I think as cryptocurrencies become more adopted and more prevalent, we're going to have some really difficult and thorny questions about jurisdiction that are not going to be resolvable, I think, in traditional terms. So to finalize the answer question, should citizens be worried if they want to move money and we've gone to a state-oriented cryptocurrency, assuming it's a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin? No, I, citizens should be very happy if that happens because I think we are at that point now talking about jurisdiction not being much of an issue anymore all right let's go to the next question we all heard the news this is a group where that actually might be true i don't know if it's true in the world at large that japan passed a law where bitcoin is considered kind of a prepayment instrument which has implications in the way bitcoin exchanges operate japan became the first country where bitcoin is officially recognized as a form of payment do you think that other countries may follow suit during 2017? 
Um, possibly. Uh, it's not clear to me that it's not also a form of payment in the United States as well. Um, Bitcoin exchangers are money transmitters in the United States. People have gone to jail and then later been released from jail because they were trading Bitcoins at local Bitcoins and someone said, well, you are an unauthorized money transmitter. And then the appeals court said, well, no, this isn't money. But the first court said, well, it is money. And so there might not be a single unitary decision in the United States because the IRS is one thing about it and FinCEN says another thing and different state and federal courts have said other things. But there are certainly lenses you can look at Bitcoin even without this type of unitary decision and say it's a form of payment in the United States today as it already already is operating so I'm not totally convinced that what happened in Japan is the first time it's happened though certainly it's one of the clearer announcements that we've seen about taking a position on Bitcoin will other countries follow definitely I believe eventually every country with an operating financial system will have some type of regulation and policy position on cryptocurrencies and the ones that are more sophisticated will have more favorable ones I mean Singapore has had a very positive view on cryptocurrencies from the beginning they've had generally favorable legislation from the beginning wouldn't surprise me to see a Switzerland a Malta a Luxembourg a Gulf country also taking generally uh, ambitious positions on cryptocurrencies and over time we will see uh, we will see more and more of this so uh, the trend is not that fewer countries will take a position uh, the trend is that more countries will take a position all right apart from the activities of speculators what other factors are behind the high volatility witnessed in Bitcoin value. And in your opinion, do you think that Bitcoin will become reasonably stable like most fiat currencies of developed economies? First of all, I am going to make a, I think, nuanced point on speculators. People say this as if it's a bad thing, but the most stable currencies, the euro dollar exchange rate is fairly stable not totally stable, fairly stable and it's the most traded currency pair in the world something like five trillion dollars worth a day it's a lot of speculators doing that trade right I mean some of it is truly trade flows but it's a lot of people hedging betting betting on currency directions in one way or another and when you have a lot of volume and liquidity it tends to reduce spreads and reduce volatility because there's a deep market uh, for buyers and sellers. So the best way for any cryptocurrency to reduce its volatility on the speculation aspect is for there to be a lot more traders of it, not fewer. The fewer they are, the more that someone could come in and move the market because there's not a big order book of buyers and sellers. So speculators in this context are probably a good thing, not a bad thing. Now, why is there volatility? There is volatility because the underlying dynamics of Bitcoin are still not well known. There's still a lot of actual risk, actual speculativeness in Bitcoin itself. So Bitcoin actually had a fairly stable period a few months back where for several months, it was bouncing around $250 a Bitcoin. And think for a while, it had gotten more stable than some currency pairs, much more stable than some commodities. And then now, the last few months, it's back in action again. Partially because there's activity in the space. There's many crises in the space. Oh, there's going to be a contentious hard fork. Price drops. 
Oh, it looks like there isn't. Price recovers. These are fundamental underlying risk factors. And so to the degree that they exist, there will be natural volatility in the, um, in the underlying value. It's normal. It's still a startup currency in a way, right? Like if you look at the U.S. dollar, the U.S. dollar is a blue chip currency. It's a Fortune 50 currency. It's a Fortune 5 currency. It's buying stock of AT&T. It's unlikely to do anything too dramatic value-wise. Okay, there's not going to be a ton of volatility, but also it's unlikely to also have 10x returns. So Bitcoin over the last year has gone up 5x. No major currency goes up 5x over the last year. It's less volatile. So it has the dynamics of a startup. It bounces all over the map, but if it does well, it's going to continue likely to go up in price. So that's not a price prediction, by the way. I make no. If I knew how to predict Bitcoin prices, well, I'd be trading all day, and I, I can assure you that's not what I do. Um, but I think it's normal at this stage that it's going to be more volatile than a currency. You know, the market cap of Bitcoin is in the tens of billions. The market cap of the money supply of major currencies in the many trillions, and they've been in use for decades and decades, and they have hundreds of millions of users, which provides a supply-demand balance. And so, of course, they're going to be more stable right now. There's no question about that. Over time, cryptocurrencies have gotten, Bitcoin has gotten more stable. In percentage terms, it's gotten more stable. Over time, if it succeeds, it will become even more stable. Will it become as stable as the US dollar? Probably not. I think it can become as stable as gold or oil or other commodity type monies. I think Bitcoin is a commodity money. It is not a sovereign money. And so it's always going to have more uh, volatility in it than, I think, a sovereign currency. But I think it can be very similar to one of those commodity asset classes in its volatility. Okay. When reading on state-owned currencies, we see proposals to centralize issuance to enable monetary policy control, monetary policy controls. Oh, before I do, I'll answer the question from Sarah in the comments. Is the ongoing debate on block size and Bitcoin a limited reason for volatility and possible hard fork? Definitely. I mean, definitely that's part of the very short-term right now volatility. Um, and, you know, with Bitcoin every few months, there's usually something. And this right now is the something that's driving volatility. So, with our proposals to centralize issuance to limit to enable monetary policy controls, removing an unchangeable issuance schedule, use centralized authorized centrally authorized minutes to secure the ledger, removing censorship resistance, introduce KYC AML, removing permissionless access and anonymity. What effect would these Policies have on technical innovation, servicing the underbanked, and stability as a store of value. Um, we touched upon this a little bit earlier. We'll have different effects on each of those. Stability as a store of value, all this will mean is that it will take on the stability of the national sovereign currency it's meant to uh, represent. So if you have a relatively stable currency like the U.S. dollar, it will be relatively stable. If you make a cryptocurrency of the Venezuelan Bolivar with the monetary issue schedule of the Venezuelan Bolivar, it is going to be not particularly stable. So, um, but that's actually right. I mean, you wouldn't say I'm making a crypto dollar that's meant to represent a dollar and it has a different monetary policy than the dollar. Because then you've issued something else. It's not a crypto dollar. It's a crypto other dollar. So if you have a cryptocurrency that is meant to be the sovereign currency of your country, it should follow the monetary policy of your 
country. So I think that's actually fine. Uh, it doesn't strike me as unlikely that they'll want centralized miners of some type for censorship resistance, and we would lose the censorship resistance there. And as we mentioned at length earlier, that they will want KYC and AML. That is the one that I think will have the most impact, to be honest. Because if you have KYC and AML, you take away the permissionless aspect, you take away the fact that you take away the permissionless settlement for machines, for software. Because presumably you'd have to go register your software, get an access key, uh, be responsible for the behavior of your software, KYC yourself. It's going to be different than how Bitcoin works then. So I would see that as the biggest change if they had these types of topics. Hello, Antonis. I would like to know your thoughts on this. A government's dream from the revenue tax collection standpoint is that 100% of their citizens bankable and using earning spending digital money. So collecting taxes is as easy as a push of a button. True. Uh, which the state-owned cryptos can make that reality happen. Maybe. To be determined. Once a central bank issues cryptocurrency, it will prompt mass adoption of it. I don't know. Maybe. Though we will technically argue it's not the same as cryptocurrency, you know, from Bitcoin and other altcoins in the sense of being open permissionless. Yes, true. It will still have its boundaries and make true cryptocurrencies more valuable as people realize the difference. Look, the key for a government to have full visibility into people's spending, earnings, and therefore taxation is less about whether they issue a cryptocurrency. It's more if they eliminate cash. Right, so most the most simple way to reduce visibility of a transaction is to use cash. Um, there's a reason that in every movie you've seen of drug lords, there's eventually a scene where the big suitcase is full of cash because it's a little bit awkward if you're sending tens of millions of dollars of wire transfers to your special underground layer, someone eventually is going to ask questions on what those things are. And so there are um, uh, those types of activities tend to end up being cash-based. I'm going to get the statistic wrong, so I'm not going to say it, but I seem to recall, and maybe this is an urban myth, I don't know, but it would make sense to me that Pablo Escobar had calculated a loss rate from the cash he had buried in his yard to mice eating it. And that was okay. He was willing to take that because, you know, you're going to put it somewhere and you're not going to be able to put it in a bank. So the, um, the key to, I think, having full trackability as a government is being willing to say, I am getting rid of cash. Now, Will it eliminate everything? No, it will eliminate everything because people can still barter outside the system, right? So if you barter outside the system, so you can still avoid taxation. So if you said, you know, I'm a barber, you're a masseuse, hey, I'll give you a haircut uh, and you'll give me a back massage, we won't report it, we're not going to pay uh, income tax on it. You can still do that, but you lose all of the advantages of having money to do that with, right? One of the reasons you have money is to avoid this double incidence of wants so that if you're a masseuse and you need a haircut, you can just give me money in order to give you a haircut and I don't have to simultaneously want a back massage. So you don't take it down to zero but you reduce it an awfully long way. And I suspect the type of government that is very keen on eliminating cash is probably not simultaneously keen on running the cryptocurrency. Right? What I think they'd want to push towards is eliminate cash and everyone please use their centralized digital banking platform. And you see there is a 
worldwide push against cash. And this is succeeding in some countries, less so in others. The Scandinavian countries have almost completely eliminated it. India is going through a crazy demonetization experiment where they overnight um, said these two notes, the two most commonly used ones, are no longer valid. Interestingly enough, it was the day I arrived in India, and it was really quite a nuisance because you couldn't actually get any cash out to use in, you know, in the market or for a taxi or what have you. And the general idea is to force India, which before then was largely a cash-based, informal cash-based transaction economy, to force it onto digital payments because there would be, in theory, less uh, tax evasion, less corruption, and so on. So that's the uh, government dream, as you're saying, from a revenue collection perspective. It's also a little bit a central banker's dream because you can implement negative interest rates. So if you want to implement negative interest rates, if you want to be highly stimulative, if you want to force people to spend their money, right? That's why you want to be stimulative. Hey, you keep your money in the bank, you're going to lose 1% uh, every six months. Go spend it. You need to be able to not allow cash because otherwise if you implement, I don't know, 4% negative interest rates, everyone's going to say, hey, thank you very much. I'm just going to withdraw my cash and put in a safety deposit box or put it under my bed where I'll lose 0% per year. If you can't pull it out into cash, then you can implement negative interest rates. So the revenue services of a country would like everything cash to go away, I think. Central bankers might like it to go away, I think. People tend not to like cash to go away. Um, some, some vague sense that it might give up some control, but also just practically, there are times it really is convenient to have something that is in no way dependent on any type of network in order to operate. A couple weeks ago here in Cyprus, we had the main credit card processor had an outage. And by a main credit card processor, they have like 90% market shares. They couldn't make payments right, like an hour. Like I was literally at the grocery store, and I couldn't make a payment, and luckily I had some cash, so I paid cash and got on with my day. But if I didn't have cash on me, we'd have an issue. So the consumer doesn't tend to love the idea of getting rid of cash completely. Governments do have a little bit of that tendency, and over time, they're pushing to eliminate it. Noting that, I mean, the U.S. currency in circulation is going up, not down, despite all this. So, I know what to make of that, but it is going up, actually. So, but I think that's the, that's the question. You want to have perfect visibility of your citizens' transactions, you got to get rid of cash. All right. Last question from before. When I was reading the materials about centrally banned cryptocurrencies, I started wondering the following. Why don't banks try to make transaction fees lower and to reconsider the mechanism of providing better security by means of blockchains, making the process automated, so that a user would just be able to receive transfer money without thinking about anything else instead of creating a supposedly new trend in bank operations. The objective of most cryptocurrencies lies in decentralization, no trust needed, and the fact that it's a world currency. That's why people use them. If they wanted to use banks, they will. It seems that banks are trying to distract users' attention for decentralized currencies with a better solution to keep users. Or is my approach too simplistic? Look, I actually don't think the main reason there's not full adoption of cryptocurrencies is because banks are stopping it. Cryptocurrencies for most retail usage cases today are totally inconvenient and not easy to use and not very well tuned to consumer needs. I mean, in the Western world, retail payments aren't actually a different difficult problem. Credit cards have the credit card companies or debit card companies, but certainly credit companies have divided a wide range of offerings to make it appealing to use their card. Travel rewards, special benefits, platinum card. You go, you swipe, you get credit provision, so they're lending you money 
free of charge for the first 30 days. So you get free float. And you get extra points. And these costs are socialized on the merchant and everyone else and on other consumers. But you don't know that when you're using the card. And so it's pretty appealing. So I don't know that it's particularly hugely more appealing for someone to say, oh, I have to figure out how cryptocurrency works and use that. And no merchants at a first approximation accepted yet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So retail payments in the developed world have had 40, 50, 60 years of optimization to become convenient for users. And cryptocurrency is nowhere near that yet. It's going to happen, but not yet. Um, banks don't want to lower transaction fees because they make money from transaction fees. Um, and where transaction fees have been lowered industry-wide, like they were in the UK, was primarily when government stepped in and said, you are going to do transactions faster and cheaper. Thank you very much. This is the new rule. This is how you're going to play now. Um, if I'm a bank, transaction fees make up a meaningful percentage of my revenues. I'm in no particular hurry to lower them, except if com competitive pressures or regulatory pressures push me to lower them. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it costs banks 25 cents to send a wire through Fedwire. I don't know how much your bank charges you to send a wire, but my guess is it's a lot more than 25 cents. It's true they have some additional cost beyond Fedwire, but I suspect they make money on wire transfers. And I suspect a wire transfer is hugely more expensive to send than an ACH transaction, which they tend to charge not a lot of money from, for. And I believe the primary reason is to do price discrimination. If you say, oh, I really need to send this today, as opposed to I can wait until tomorrow, you're going to pay a premium. Um, I don't see that being changed unless there's some forcing pressure to change it, whether regulatory or competitive if people really start using other mechanisms and then they're just forced to do it. By the way, it doesn't mean banks are bad guys. It doesn't mean they're any different than any other business. If they can, businesses generally try to keep revenue high and cost low in absence of pressure for that to change. So uh, I don't think that the normal model would be that being a huge rush to reduce their transaction fees unless they were forced into it. Okay, so that was those were the questions that were submitted in advance. It was a really good set of questions uh, this time. And so thank you, group, for uh, submitting them. We have about three minutes left, so I can maybe take one more question from the live chat if someone can if someone's interested and or we can talk about anything else uh, for the next few minutes Oh, there's one more that George chatted me. What are the implications for government-backed deposit insurance if central bank money is widely accessible by individuals and businesses? Oh, that is a great question. This, to me, is something that I can absolutely see happening. Um, today, central bank money is provided to the banks, who then provide uh, effectively the distribution of banking services to individuals. I think that is primarily a reflection of technological constraints at the time the current system was set up. So it would have not been feasible for central banks to provide retail access to consumers to central bank money. It's not clear to me why that is the case today. Um, I wouldn't expect the central banks to provide a branch network but why you couldn't have an online account and be able to deposit money with the federal or your central bank and have no credit risk, no counterparty risk, seems to me just an artifact of our existing system more than anything that seems impossible. 
Um, now, maybe they don't want to, some customer service costs and what have you, but it's certainly much more feasible than it was 100 years ago when you had the branch network. And for that money, you wouldn't need deposit insurance. And it would be, I think you'd see a real spread of interest rates paid and the riskiness of the institute, the depository institution, that's more of a spread than you'd see now, right? You can say, look, I can take no credit risk whatsoever, no counterparty risk whatsoever by lending my money to a central bank. And if instead I want to lend my money somewhere else, well, maybe that somewhere else doesn't need deposit insurance. Or maybe they'll pay for deposit insurance and then say above that amount, they're going to be riskier and pay, have to pay a higher interest rate. I think that's a very interesting question. If I were a bank, I'd be, if I were a central bank, I'd be thinking about why, in fact, I'm not offering that. And if I'm a bank, I'd be a little bit worried that they might offer that because I think it would be appealing to people. It's never been totally obvious to me that, you know, when we had the financial crisis in the US, there was some concern that the banks would fail and people's deposits would be at risk. And then in Cyprus, there was an actual haircut of deposits and lots of people lost a lot of money. And then there was some kind of high moralizing from outside Cyprus of like, well, it serves them right. They should have, the depositors should have known. With all due respect, I think that's unfair. Evaluating the credit worthiness of a bank is a difficult, sophisticated job, even for someone who's a trained financial analyst. It doesn't seem that it's particularly logical to expect any random civilian when they need core banking services to also become a banking credit analyst. Right? I mean, it's ridiculous. You might be a musician. You might be an 18 year old soldier. You might be a 75 year old pensioner who runs a coffee shop. How are you supposed to know if XYZ bank is credit worthy or not? Particularly when in the case of Cyprus, they were the main two banks of the country and you saw them everywhere. So this idea that consumers should have a sophisticated understanding of banking depository risk, I always find very strange. If it was that obvious to consumers that these banks were gonna fail, then it should have been 10 times more obvious to the relevant central banks, which should have stepped in well in advance to keep them from failing. The fact that they failed is primarily a failure of their regulator who more or less sole job in life is regard to the banks is to ensure their stability and they failed to do so. So it's a little bit odd position to say that the central bank of Cyprus and then by extension, the European central bank did not manage to ensure the stability of those banks, but any random depositor was somehow at fault for keeping money in these banks beyond the deposit insurance level. So, there is a weird dynamic there that doesn't feel totally right and totally stable. And I suspect we will see ultimately some central bank uh, offer central bank access to a broader set of people than their key financial institutions at some point in our lifetime. So, all right, everyone, we're at 7.02 here. So I think we have completed the session. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Again, great session. Have a great weekend. And we'll be uh, on schedule uh, together for the next few weeks uh, to wrap up uh, the MOOC. So I hope everyone's having a good time. And I'll see you at the next session.